protecting hunting with a true advocate. His name is Bill Gaines. Here we go. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. gentlemen welcome to episode number 58 this is jim huntsman your host coming at you from the broken time studio in hayden idaho hope you guys are doing great uh glad you guys have tuned in uh we have uh, an episode today that i'm going to talk to a uh, a hunting lobbyist uh, an advocate and uh his name is bill gaines and he was referred to me by the director of idaho fishing game uh director ed shriever uh, suggested that I, I I could talk to him about uh, this particular topic that we're that we're uh, we've been kind of involved in over the last couple of weeks, you know. And I know a lot of us are celebrating and kind of taking a victory dance over this um, situation out of California where the bear ban was taking place. But this guy actually knows a lot about this topic and the situation and what they're fighting against uh, over there. And every hunter in the West specifically is going to get a lot out of this episode. And folks, I'd caution you not to tire on this topic. Don't don't allow yourself to get worn out talking about this topic because it affects us all in North America and and this this kind of infringement on hunting and hunting rights and and, and our 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 ability to do and conduct ourselves in this in this lifestyle is is at stake and and I know it might seem, you know, I don't know, frivolous or too far away to worry about or, or whatever, but that, that's not the case. We, we really have to be cognizant here. We have to be awake. We have to be aware. Um, <laughs> I hate to use the term awake. I don't mean we're woke to it or anything like that, but uh, you guys know what I mean. So anyway, we're going to get to that in, uh, in just a bit. I wanted to kind of throw a shout out to my buddy uh, down in southern Idaho who just had a baby, Roger Hall. Uh, congratulations on the on the newborn, and he had a little boy. And dude, congratulations! That's awesome. I know, uh, and, and anybody else has had. I know, I, I know another buddy of mine, Justin. He had a baby down in uh, southeast Idaho. Uh, and and many of you listening, I that that I, I don't know personally. Uh, maybe you've had uh, a baby recently, and uh, just uh, you know, congratulations, guys. That's uh, really cool. I got some hot tips for you. This is for the husbands, okay? Because I I don't I don't have any hot tips for the for for you wives out there, but uh, to Roger, you know, a couple of things, uh, words of encouragement when because he had made a post saying that yeah you know he was there was some fear he was indicating that uh, he was maybe a little nervous to take the baby home and away from the hospital with all the help of the nurses and doctors and and all that kind of stuff. I know exactly how you feel, dude, and it is. It's a big deal, and and it's a big responsibility, and there's a lot of weight on your shoulders now as as a dad, and uh, and that goes for you moms as well. There's uh, uh, probably more of a burden on your shoulders, uh, and and I don't say that lightly, but um, to, to to help you guys out, here's a couple things. Okay, first of all, Roger, you're gonna have to get super used to changing diapers, and if you hate changing diapers like I did, here's what you do. Are you ready for this? <laughs> Put the diaper on backwards three times and make sure your wife notices that. She will insist on being the diaper changer so that you don't screw it up in the future. Okay, there's tip number one. Tip number two, offer to be the one that goes out and buys diapers when they run out. Don't order them online and don't make your wife, she's already exhausted, she's worn out. You go buy the diapers this gives you an excuse to swing into the sporting goods store and buy hunting supplies and ammunition. It's a very important point. Tip number three, when the, when the kid gets a little bit bigger, um, you're going to notice, you, you know, you guys are going to start buying like these dishes that are for, for uh, kids. You know, the plastic ones so they don't break the glass plates and all that kind of stuff. And if your wife is, a, is obsessed with 
cleaning your plates and putting them in the dishwasher as as much as mine is and was at the time. Here's a little hot tip for you. If you sneak into the kitchen and get you a snack, use a kid plate. That way you can put it in the sink without having to worry about washing it. Because then it's the kid's fault. That's right. Why trouble yourself with doing the dishes? Here's a cool story too, by the way. Well, I, I, this story came from my wife, but uh, I, I believe it because there's pictures to prove it. So my uh, my father-in-law's brother took, and I don't know which cousin of my wife's it was, but uh, took a little kid out that, that was uh, still uh, in diapers, you know, just a baby that, that got a little fussy out on the mountain, and it made a mule deer buck curious. The sound, the crying, and the and, and it wasn't like screaming. The baby wasn't screaming his head off or her head off or whoever it was. But uh, just kind of getting fussy, making all those noises and everything else. Well, it made the mule deer, this, this mule deer buck got curious. It was like a four point for, as, as far as the story was told in the picture that I saw. Uh, <laughs> the, the buck gets curious and comes to check out what this, what this crying sound is. And uh, the dude whacks him with his bow. <laughs> so that's a true story. Uh, pretty cool. I've heard it a million times. So I, I uh, and and uh, like I said, I've got pictures to prove it. Pretty neat. So keep that in mind, because what deer season? What for for you guys down there? I don't know if you're going to be hunting maybe early season or, or whatnot. But uh, the kiddo is going to be old enough for you, Roger, uh, to get him out there and call in a buck for you. But in all serious, from the bottom of my heart, congratulations to you guys. I it's uh, really awesome seeing all that kind of stuff come together. And 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 an actual serious tip, jokes aside. Uh, make sure you are taking care of your wife, brother, because uh, I, I could tell you from uh, four daughters and uh, that my, my youngest is, is turning 10 years old next year, which makes me old, or not next year, next week. Um, <laughs> so that's uh, it's it's a special thing and it's a special there, there's no greater calling than uh, than being a father. And, and uh, you're I could tell you that your wife. Uh, goes through a hell of a lot more hell and work uh, getting these kids up and and uh, doing what they do. It's it's just an amazing thing. So make sure you're buying her lots of presents. That's what I used to do. Uh, it took me took me a while to learn this, but I, I would buy my wife just random presents from small things to you know a little bit more expensive things, and that uh, that kind of helps show her that you appreciate all the hard work because let's face it, she's probably going to get up more often at night. She's probably going to change more diapers and she's probably going to do a lot more work. Uh, and that's just uh, sometimes the nature of it. But uh, do what you can and take care of her. And and uh, congratulations on the baby and good luck. So, guys, with that, I want to throw out a trivia question for this week. And this trivia question is going to be a little bit different. It's kind of less of a trivia question, more of a fact-finding poll, uh, if that makes sense. I want to know in in what state or province that you live in, how many black bears live in the state or province that you live in? Uh, so that I don't care if you're in New Jersey to uh, Nevada to California to uh, you know British Columbia or whatever. I don't care. Just tell me what state or province and how many black bears live there. It's good information to know. Um, and then I want to add like a little uh, a, a, an extra kicker question here. If you're hunting black bear. What method are you choosing? Baiting, calling, stock, you know, spot and stock, hounds, however, whatever your method of take is. If you wouldn't mind just answering that question, how many bears live in your state or province? And if you are hunting them, uh, what is your chosen method for, for this coming year? And I'm going to run this under the, the regular trivia. So make sure that in the subject line you put trivia and then answer the questions and then everybody who writes in, and this one's super easy because there's really not a lot of right or wrong answers. You could you could totally, uh, you know, say a wrong answer for how many what the bear population is in your state or province. But uh, really, what what uh, that's not that's not what we're looking for with this one. So just answer the question. Make sure you put trivia into the subject line so I can wrap all that up into our giveaway that's going to happen here in about six weeks or so. I'm um, putting putting that package together now. And with that, guys, I want to get in to my conversation with my new friend, Mr. Bill Gaines. And he is he has a company called Gaines and Associates. And there is going to be a website. Um, and in fact, you know what? I'm gonna message him before I put this out to see if he's got that website live yet. Uh, but I'll find out for you. But you want to check that out. If if it's available, I'll put it in the show notes. It might not be. Um, and, and on that note, guys, make sure you're, if you are enjoying the show, you are subscribed to the show, 
Uh, we, the one thing that we are working on right now is trying to build the Instagram thing, the following or whatever. Uh, I, I, and I've told you this on the show a few times before, I, I don't know much about Instagram and it's new. Uh, I'm learning, I'm getting a little bit better. And, uh, but uh, a lot of people, you know, when I try to get like some big name guest on or something, they're going to look at my Instagram followers and it, it, it's only sitting at about a thousand right now. So I need to build that. Uh, to, to, and that helps convince some of these bigger names to come on. And, and the, the reason why that's cool is because it would be cool to hear from some of these guys. Like, uh, I've been trying to get Jocko Willink on cause he's a big time elk hunter. If you don't know who Jocko Willink is, you need to check that dude out. Um, super cool guy, super motivating guy. And I want to talk to him about elk hunting cause he's been on a, he's been on a ton of podcasts, but, uh, n- never really talking about hunting. And so that's just an example. So the point is is if you wouldn't mind if you're if you're on Instagram and you're not following the Western Huntsman, jump on there at the Western Huntsman and check it out and uh, use hashtag Team Western Huntsman. Thank you guys for who uh, who has been using that hashtag. I uh, I didn't I actually just figured out how to follow that and and I, I just figured out who's like using it and you know everybody's out there tracking with that that hashtag team western huntsman hashtag team western huntsman so definitely use that too and that'll kind of help tie everything back to the the page okay i'm asking you guys to do enough stuff i appreciate all that thank you guys so much for all the support you've given us at the show uh we really really appreciate it it's just been an amazing uh, couple of months if if uh, i mean honestly the the last couple of months has have been just something else so Uh, With that, guys, I'm going to get into it with Bill Gaines. Enjoy it. Let me know. Email jim at thewesternhuntsman.com. Talk to you soon. Here we go. All right, folks, uh, this week I am on the phone with Bill Gaines down in California uh, with Gaines and Associates, and Bill is an advocate and a lobbyist for uh, the hunting community, and uh, I'll bet that keeps him pretty busy down in California. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about, I know I know that the bear, or I'm sorry, the bear hunting ban, Bill 252 down in the uh, California State Legislature was, uh, was polled. But uh, I think that we need to keep our foot on the pedal and and stay ahead of this thing because it was only pulled for you know uh, temporarily and so we're gonna we're gonna talk with Bill about that and uh, amongst other things and uh, Bill I appreciate you coming on the show hey, how you doing man I, I'm doing great Jim and, and thank you for the opportunity to come on the show so I, I it'd be a, probably a good idea to have you explain to the audience a little bit about what you do. Give us a snapshot of what you do, uh, your company, uh, and we'll kind of take it from there. No, oh, I'd be more than happy to. Well, Jim, I, I'm what is loosely called a contract lobbyist, uh, which means I'm not on staff or any you know, entity or any organization, anything like that. I'm rather a lobbyist for hire, if you will, and there's hundreds of them here in California, as there is in, in many other states, and certainly back in Washington, D.C., but, but the difference between what I am and what 99.9% of the rest of the contract lobbyists is, is that I focus only on wildlife and outdoor tradition slash hunting related issues. Mm-hmm. That's it. Uh, most contract lobbyists will represent you regardless of what your issue is, regardless of whether they believe in it or not, regardless of whether they know anything about it. Let us take your money and then we'll be happy to represent you down at the Capitol. That's the way 99% of the people in my profession do, but I'm not like that at all. I, I didn't go into lobbying because, gee, you know, I majored in poli sci and I, you know, I wanted to work in the political arena. No, that's not it at all. I didn't major in poli sci at all. In fact, <laughs> If you had uh, reached out, you know, to me in college and wanted to start talking politics over a beer, I'd I'd find my way to the exit and go find somebody to talk about hunting. Right? Yeah. I had no yeah. interest in talking about politics. I certainly wasn't naive to it. It just was not my favorite subject. In fact, it was probably my least favorite subject. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, it was kind of God's plan. I mean, I ended up finding my way into politics. 
uh, because I cared so deeply about hunting and, and there was an opportunity, it's been almost 30 years ago now for me to, to go to work for an organization, which, uh, you know, I was already a member of and, and was already active as, an, as a volunteer. And that was California Waterfowl Association because I love the duck hunt along with deer hunt and elk hunt and every other type of hunting out there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they put an ad in the paper, the old fashioned way, Jim, when you actually had to, uh, <laughs> put a one ad in the one ads, right? Yeah. I remember you know, those and, days. And this is back about 1990 and my wife saw this ad she goes hey she goes you know this is something you may be interested in and boy i saw that it said you know california waterfowl is looking for a uh, a director of government affairs and i'm going oh how cool would that be to be able to to work in an arena that you care so deeply about and know a lot about right because i've been duck hunting for years at that time along with everything else yeah anyway so uh, applied for that job went through a series of interviews and ended up getting it and then so i was staff lobbyist for cwa for about 15 years and then you know i care about more than just ducks right and so then i i made the break and, and started my own firm gains and associates which now represents i'm blessed enough to represent a variety of of uh, wildlife related groups, you know, ranging from RMEF to cow deer to Turkey Federation to wild sheep and so on and so forth here in California. And it's my absolute pleasure to represent them because I care as deeply about that wildlife and the future of hunting than, than they do. So uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm very You're blessed good. to do what I do and, and I love every minute of it. And Bobby will never retire only because I, I care so deeply about, you know, making sure that we can preserve hunting for future generations. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I can appreciate that. I wouldn't retire either. <laughs> and, and you're probably not going to be able to in the state of California. If, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you mentioned that, Jim, and, you know, I hear people, you know, all the time. I, I hear this weekly, if not daily. It's like, wow, you got job security in California. These hunting bills are never going to go away. And, <laughs> you know, frankly, I, yeah, they're right. It, it is, uh, you know, kind of a sad form of job security, but I, I would much rather have the hunting bill go, hunting bills go away and have hunting, you know, have some kind of a lock on a long-term positive future here in California. I'd go do something else and I'd spend more time hunting, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, but it's job security, unfortunately, but I wish it wasn't in that sense. Well, you came highly recommended. Uh, when the when the director of Idaho Fish and Game um, tells me that you're the guy I should talk to, uh, I take that pretty serious. And uh, and so Director Shriver sent me your way, and and uh, I'm glad we connected because I, I feel like we have a lot to talk about. And uh, uh, anything that we could do from uh, you, you know my my audience over here and. Uh, you know, this is a, an audience made up of Western hunters. I'm based in Idaho, so I always say whatever we could do from Idaho, but I've got listeners in Florida, to, to New Mexico, to Texas, and uh, even New York. Uh, so so whatever we could do to help help along, you know, I know a lot of us came together during this uh, bear ban uh, bill 252, uh, but mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of what I want to center this conversation about. Can you kind of explain a little bit? Because you you had you had a little bit of uh, warning that this bill was coming, uh, and and so you know guys like me, I didn't. I had no idea. All of a sudden, I saw this uh, you know legislation proposed to ban bear hunting in the state of California. Um, in, in fact, before we go there, let's back up and talk about the mountain lion hunting ban. Uh, can you can we talk about mountain lions and, and bobcats in the state of California for a minute? Oh, of course. And tell us a little bit about how that happened in terms of the ban and what the effects have been since then. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the ban on mountain lion, I mean, Ronald Reagan, when he was governor of California way back when, actually, uh, you know, signed a moratorium on on mountain lion hunting in California. But to to make Mm -hmm. that extremely formal, it was brought before the California public on a statewide general ballot. No, gosh, I want to say it was like 1989 time frame. And, and the public, you know, not knowing any better, went ahead and, and voted, you know, to, to uh, define the mountain lions as a special status species here in California. Obviously, that shut off hunting. And, it and did how, leave dep- how was that justified to the public? Like, how, how did that, how was that marketed to the public? You know, the, the bill didn't pass by much. You know, but I mean, it's, it's kind of the same way they're trying to market, you know, a bear hunting ban here in California. Gee, these are fuzzy critters. You know, they, they try to imply that, they're, that their uh, populations are seriously in danger, you know, that they don't harm anything, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, it was basically, you know, a, a, a smokescreen, if you will, about what mountain lions 
aren't as opposed to what they really are, mm-hmm. right? And the general public, I mean, here in California, you know, even back 30 years ago when that ban was passed into law, I mean, the overwhelming majority of us live in urban areas. I mean, they're completely out of touch with hunting. I mean, I was raised with a BB gun in one hand and a fishing pole in the other, right? And I, I get the sense, Jim, that you were as well. Oh, yeah. You know, but, but we're a rarity, especially here in California, even back then, because you know, the, the big major centers are the San Francisco Bay Area and the Los Angeles area where many of these people never even get out in the outdoors and certainly don't know anything about, about hunting at all. So, or wildlife for that matter, or wildlife management. So it was a pretty easy sell back in those days. It caught, caught us a little bit flat, but that was actually right before I went into the, uh, the lobbying industry, if you will. That passed like a year before I went into it. So I wasn't engaged in that effort because I was working in the defense industry at the time, you know, but the California public, you know, is is very easy to sway because they don't have much of a knowledge at all on these issues. And in those days, I mean, the hunting community and the wildlife community, we just weren't prepared. I mean, it caught us a little bit flat footed. It was the first thing that really came out. that was a real anti hunting measure and, and they just beat us to the punch on it. And again, it didn't pass by much, but it did pass. We actually, I want to guess it was 1997. We put it back on the ballot to try to reverse that, you know, and, and, you know, that one did not pass, unfortunately, and, but it did not pass by much, but nevertheless, I mean, if we're going to reverse that, we got to go back to the California, you know, uh, general public to do it. And then that's a real uphill battle because, you know, we're about 80%, you know, urbanites now. So it would take yeah, a massive I, and extremely expensive campaign. I feel like that's, Almost like I don't want to say any, you know, nothing is impossible, right? But that that is a tall order, man. Um, because I I think that there there is this huge disconnect, like you were talking about these these big urban areas, like you've you've got San Francisco, you've got Los Angeles, and it's the same thing in in uh, places like Idaho. We've got Boise and these urbanites that live in Boise that have no clue as to, you know, for example, the mule deer migrations of southern Idaho, right? And so they want to put trails in everywhere and block the the migration patterns. And the same thing happens in uh, places like Montana with some of the bigger cities, which don't even compare uh, in size to, to the California urban areas. But there is this big disconnect that you were kind of alluding to. And and they sell these um, th- this anti hunting legislation and 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 the thought and the cultural idea behind an anti hunting thought process, you know, purely based on emotions. Um, and so the science is is lacking. And and I guess that that leads to a question as to uh, I, I, talking about maybe some of the consequences that came out of the mountain lion ban because there's a lot of information online that I can I can go in and read. Uh, some of it's confusing and conflicting. What is your take on that what is your take on on what the consequences of banning mountain lion and bobcat hunting uh what's that done to the state well i'll tell you you know one thing it's done is it's had a devastating impact on our deer populations for sure Uh um you know and and so obviously we can't hunt them so we've lost hunting as a management tool as i mentioned a minute or two ago i mean the uh the language that was placed on the ballot left depredation in place, you know, but we've got some administrative efforts these days by uh, folks within the department and so forth that, they, you know, have really put the crunch on what it takes to get a depredation permit, you know, for mountain lions as well. So, I mean, to do that, I mean, you've got to have a really serious and rare, you know, situation. So, I mean, managing them at all right now is, is almost been completely, you know, removed from our books and, and it has had a substantial impact on our deer population, not to mention, you know, public safety concerns. I mean, we're seeing mountain lions in places that we've never seen them before. You see more incidences where, you know, cats, dogs, pets, so forth. And and people, you know, are are being threatened by mountain lions. So I I just hope it doesn't take for, for, you know, you know, too many fatalities to stack up before we start to rethink the need to manage apex predators like mountain lions. Is it, is it fair to say that the, the state of California spends money, uh, pretty substantial dollars on, uh, you know, some of these depredation hunts that they have to pay professional hunters or whoever they're 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 using for that. Uh, probably the wildlife service. Um, what what is it in California? Is it Fish and Game or is it uh, Fish and Wildlife Service? What what is it? Well, it was Fish and Game. This is kind of an indicator of where the state is headed. Up until about ten years ago, it was the Department of Fish and Game. 
you know, and, and then they actually changed the name of that to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then obviously the, okay. uh, the animal rights folks were a big push behind that. Now we still have the California Fish and Game Commission, which uh, is the entity that actually adopts the regulations. Of course, Fish and Wildlife makes recommendations to them. But the only reason why we can still call that the California Fish and Game Commission, I mean, game instead of wildlife, is because it's in the Constitution. You know, and changing the name of an entity in the Constitution is a whole different, heavier lift than simply changing the name of an agency. So it is still the California Game Fishing game commission, but yeah, something fish and wildlife now. Gotcha, and so and 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 it is not a constitutional right to hunt in the state of California, right? Like like somewhere like Idaho. It it is not, and I'm glad you brought that up, Jim, because it is a constitutional right to fish in California, and and many many times over the years, I've had people call me up and go, Bill, I've got the answer, I've got the silver bullet. Let's just put in the Constitution that we have the right to hunt in California. And test me, Jim, if I could do that, that would be my absolute top priority. But sure. again, changing the Constitution in California is a massive heavy lift that kind of gets back to what we talked about, you know, as far as, you know, the, the urban rural splits and where the votes are and people's understanding and so forth and so on. And we thought about that 50 years ago, probably could have got it done. Yeah. In yeah. 2021, almost impossible. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I, I don't think somebody like Senator uh, Scott Weiner is going to sign or, or agree to a constitutional amendment that uh, uh, gives the right to, uh, of hunting in the state of California for sure. And and so that like re- revenue wise, uh, we I, I was I was starting to ask you this question, but do you know if if it's true that now the state of California spends just a you know a, a pretty substantial amount of money trying to um, take care of this mountain lion issue uh, via w- whatever means they take care of that with. I'm not uh, super familiar with it versus when there was a hunting season on them that took care of the problem itself uh, in, in that way, uh, the, the revenue that was generated from that. Well, I, I will tell you, Jim, that, that public safety concerns and public slash wildlife interaction incidences are, are, are going up in a massive way here in California, not only with mountain lions, coyotes Mm -hmm. i mean we've got people from cities like huntington beach you know you know gray-haired grandmas that are coming in front of the fish and game commission and the local media and so forth just screaming about the fact that they've got coyotes walking down their urban streets and taking their dogs and cats i mean so so the incidents of public safety and and uh you know just urban you know interaction with coyotes is is gone absolutely out of sight here in urban areas in california but we're seeing that with mountain lions and we're definitely seeing it with bears as well. Department of Fish and Wildlife gets a lot of calls on those things. And, and normally those are handled by the enforcement department. And, and so the amount of money they're spending on enforcement as a result of, of public safety and, and public interaction with wildlife has gone up substantially, I will tell you that, over the course of the last 10 years, for sure. There there seems – there's like this uh... – theory that I have, I don't know if it's a theory is the right word, but uh, there's like this perception that California is just the way that the, the, the state is managed uh, through the government. It's, it's just so upside down financially and, and nothing really makes sense on the, on the expenditures there. And, and I don't know if, if that's an accurate perception or not, because I, I, I actually, I, I guess where I'm going is I, I feel bad for people uh, I've got some friends that that live in California, and they're hunters, and they're outdoorsmen. They like to fish. They like to get out and chase mule deer and bear, and and all these things. And and they're, they're these. The rest of the country looks at California like this whacked out, you know, uber extreme left wing, you know, controlled state where you have to have permission to sneeze and go to the grocery store. And I know that that's an exaggerated, um, you know, way to put that, but. Uh, I, I guess, I guess, in fact, instead of going there, let's let's turn and go to the bear ban, or, or unless you have anything to say about that, what I, what I was just talking about. Well, I I'll, I'll make it you know pretty simple. I mean, when it comes to the battle to protect hunting and maintain those traditions, and and wildlife conservation with you know hunting as the and hunting dollars as as a you know, a, a key and critical driver. I mean, battles to save all that. I mean, we're on the tip of the spear here in California. Make no mistake about that. And, and, you know, and the saying goes, you know, as goes in California, so goes the rest of the nation. There's a lot of truth to that as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we lose bear hunting in California, 
I promise you it's coming to your neighborhood next. You well, know, and, and that's, so that's you, you're exactly right. And that's that's why you and I are talking right now. And that's why because I've, I've gotten messages there. The, Jim, what are you what are you doing getting overly involved in in, uh, you know, issues coming out of California? And, and the reason is, is for exactly what you just said. They're, they've already taken, you know, this when, when we're talking about eating an elephant one bite at a time, they've already gotten rid of mountain lion hunting. They've gotten rid of bat, bobcat hunting. They've gotten rid of trapping and hound hunting. Uh, I'm not sure if they've gotten rid of baiting in the state of California. Um, oh, yeah, they have. They have? Okay, <laughs> oh, yeah. they have. So. Yeah. So what what that does is that that's going to fuel the fire. There's already a discussion in the state of Washington to ban the spring bear hunt season, right? And and so that's going to add a lot of um, empowerment to the people that want to ban the spring bear hunt in um, you know Washington. Well, that's going to bleed over into places like Idaho and Montana and and uh, Utah and Colorado, all these other western states, and you know places like Idaho. We're pretty fortunate. We it, it, that seems like it's not even possible. Right now in California to even to even discuss the thought of banning bear hunting, there would be uh, riots in the street that Antifa would be jealous of. Right. And so uh, that's today. What I'm worried about is 10 years from now or 20 years from now. All that stuff that that, that is going to bleed into our states. Well, yeah. Let, and, me, let me give you let me give you this example, Jim. I mean, the, the, spons- the sponsors of Senate Bill 252, the Bear Bill, you know, is the Humane Society of the United States. That's not a California organization. That's a national organization that, uh, and an extremely powerful one that I hope every hunter listening to this show is well aware of, because they have nothing to do with spaying and neutering, and they have everything to do with trying to outlaw hunting across the board. <laughs> if not they only listen to this show, they're right. aware of the Humane Society of the United States. Yeah, Absolutely. for sure. Well, why do you think the Humane Society picks California to tee up this bill? I think they because have, they yeah. know the playing field here in California is the most favorable to what they're trying to do. You know, the, the liberal, you know, urban legislators have Demo- primarily Democrats, you know, have super majorities in the House and in the Assembly. Right? I mean, in the Assembly and in the Senate, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they know that the playing field is just ripe to pass legislation like that here in California, like nowhere else in the nation. So let's bring it to California, let's pass it there, and then let's march it northern and eastward until we've got bear hunting ban throughout the whole United States. I've read that uh, article on uh, this, the bear ban in California from the Humane Society. Um, I've read that probably two or three times, and every time my blood just boils. The way that they market this pack, or, or, or they package the whole idea of hunting and bear hunting, and, and and how it's labeled as oh, you know, the trophy hunters are annihilating the bear populations of California, and they're only trophy trophy hunters, so they're not hunting the smaller bears that are near Tahoe. No, they're going into the back country to get the big Bruins, you know, and and, and the way that they package this and marketed this. It, it's it, I could see that totally playing into the emotions of somebody who lives in downtown San Francisco that's never seen a bear outside of a zoo. Uh, they they don't know what bears eat. They don't know what bears do. They don't know how they they pattern and migrate and uh, breed and and all these things that that go into a bear's lifestyle. But I could see somebody sitting there reading this article uh, in a park in San Francisco and and. Getting this image of a savage, bloodthirsty hunter out there looking for a big trophy bear to take the bear uh, hide home and simply make a rug out of, as if it's not taken for the meat, it's not harvested um, for other things outside of just the trophy aspect of it. It makes it makes me sick, if, if we're being honest. That, that article makes me sick. And it's stuff like that that we have to counter. And so... Uh, uh, uh. Go ahead. I, I've, I've long said, Jim, that, that the, the hunting community, we are our own worst enemy in that we have failed to do our own education of people in, in urban areas. I mean, you know, I've talked to a, a lot of kids in high school that, that love to hunt, and I'll say, hey, do you ever talk to your buddies about hunting? Because, you know, the R3 effort, the recruitment, retention, and reactivation, right? We're trying to build our hunting communities and our fishing communities, for that matter, bring more people into those traditions. You know, and, and so it's like I'll talk to my, my uh, friends who have kids in, in high school, for example, and I'll say, do you ever talk to your buddies about getting out hunting? You go, oh, no, no, no. I, I'm afraid to bring that up. 
It's like, well, why are you afraid to bring that up? I mean, you know, hunters have a proud tradition. I mean, I could go on and on and on about, you know, the wildlife conservation model and how hunters are the ones that not only built it, but that drive it and, you know, the benefits to game and non-game species. You guys, you know that, Jim, you know that, but, Mm -hmm. but the general public in the urban areas don't know that. They don't know the benefits of hunting. They don't know the revenue streams. They, They don't know the the good work that groups like RMEF and others are doing on the ground, you know, to, to benefit the habitat of these species and the other species that use those habitats. I mean, we've got to do a better job of educating urban people as to, uh, you know, the role, the very, very positive role of, of hunting when it comes to wildlife conservation for all species, not just game species. And we've got to work harder to get them out in the field, get them out there, educate them, you know, like, Get them to get their their hunter safety certificate and get a hunting license. I mean, I think every we have we have forty million people in California. We sell about two hundred and fifty thousand hunting licenses. Crunch those numbers, right? We're about a half of one percent of our public hunt. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's pretty scary, and and that's one of the arguments that we hear the animal rights folks bring up all the time when we're debating, you know, policy of whether it be in front of the Fish and Game Commission or in front of the state legislature. It's like, well, you know, ninety nine point five percent of California doesn't hunt. Well, that doesn't mean that ninety five ninety nine point five percent of Californians, you know, have to be anti hunting. They're not, yeah. right? A lot of them would strongly support the good things that we do on the ground, but we've got to reach out and educate them. You know. Winter is a great time to get stocked up, geared up, and dialed in for this coming hunting season coming up in 2021. So I want to save you guys some money. And first off, let's start with Hoffman Boots. Hoffman Boots are the boot of choice at the Western Huntsman. And it used to be, Hoffman Boots used to be like this little North Idaho secret with their hunting boots. But these boots are great boots. They won't cost you as much as some of the other top name brands out there. But they are every bit as good. And to save it even a little bit more money, I want you to type in the promo code HUNTSMAN10 to save you 10% off at checkout. Now, i got to give you a fair warning real quick up front with Hoffman Boots. They're, they're like six weeks out right now on orders uh, because everybody is jumping on the Hoffman Boot train, and you should too. Next, i got Scree Gear, Extreme Mountain Gear. This high-performance hunting attire and gear is specifically tested for camel patterns throughout the North American continent, and it's backed by a great company. Guys, Scree has a great history. I tested this gear all last season, and I put that gear through the ringer up and down, left and right, to and fro. Save you a little bit of money. Use promo code The Western Huntsman at checkout to save you 15% off and free shipping. That's a hell of a deal. Check out Scree Gear. ScreeGear.com. It'll be in the show notes. Last and certainly not least, Phelps Game Calls, the choice, the selected call company of the Western Huntsman officially for 2021. Guys, there's some uh, big things happening with Phelps Game Calls, and I can't say enough good things about this company. What a story. Started in a just like this workshop, and now it's one of the premier hunting call companies out there on the market. And if you haven't tried Phelps Game Calls, you're really missing out. You you really are missing out on those diaphragm elk reads. Uh, they are amazing, and they will. The amp frame is an absolute game changer. Check it out at Phelps.com and use promo code Huntsman10 at checkout to save you 10%. Let's get back into the conversation, guys. Thank you to our sponsors, and thank you for supporting our sponsors. Here we go. Yeah, I, I agree. And and now I, I want to talk about how we do that because I, I want to – you know how you can, you can see those uh, – if you're watching TV and you see these ads of like Sarah McLaughlin singing in the background and and these you know humane society ads that they put out there, how do how do we counter that to the masses in the in a way that the anti hunting associations uh, and organizations, how you know they're good at that? How do we counter that and get this you know, message and, out and, to and the and masses? No, no, I, I I hear you on that, and, and I mean it, it's certainly far more than every hunter going out and reaching out to somebody who lives in an urban area and 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 trying to educate them. I mean, we've actually talked about this. We we've talked about banning all the various organizations in the state that care about wildlife and care about hunting together to build a war chest, if you will, and and put things you know on the radio and TV and so forth in a lot of these urban areas. I think that's what it's going to take. 
you know, is, is a massive media outreach campaign similar mm-hmm. to what the animal rights folks do. I mean, it's a multi, multi-million dollar effort, you know, to do that. But I think it, that's something if we're ever going to achieve the, the uh, level of education of the, the inner city folks that we need to, to to really protect hunting over the long term, we've got to pull something like that together. I, I agree. And, and I've, I've been thinking about that. How, how does a hunting community come up with $30, $40 million dollars? And, and come out with both online, television, radio, the, just a campaign that is not necessarily promoting, you know, the public to go hunting, but it, more of an educational thing. Like, you know, did you know that, uh, you know, the uh, turkey numbers in the United States were, were almost at extinction levels. And, and now there's right. millions and millions and millions, millions of them that's due to hunters. That is not due to the humane society. That is not due to the, you know the senator or center for biological diversity or whatever that, that other yeah, that's group. what it is yeah. For biological diversity yeah. <laughs> yeah another one of our folks yeah yeah they're uh, uh anyways well you know I, I i've long said you know it's it's kind of funny but it's not i said look we got 40 million people in california i noted that you know you know a few minutes ago but i said the last thing we need is 40 million hunters in california it's hard enough to get on a refuge to chase ducks these days. Oh, for it's hard sure. enough to get out to chase deer, you know, on, on opening weekend and not having somebody on every point, you know, looking at you, right? You know, but we do need to build our hunter numbers, you know, substantially higher than they are right now. We and and I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, I know there's a lot of people listening that are like, now don't let's not get started on getting more hunters in the woods, and and I I understand that. Uh, and and I think that for who we need to who we need to target and talk about it, it's not hunters we need to convince it's it's not the extreme anti hunting community that we need to convince it's the average person out there that um you know they go to the grocery store they get their groceries from from the store they're happy they're content with that they really don't have an opinion one way or the other uh and and when when you compare two different things let's use facebook for example when you compare two different things you have the the pro hunting people, and usually they're hunters, and and they might sometimes they don't necessarily always portray the hunting lifestyle in the most positive light, right? They put a, right. a, a really bad negative imagery type kind of picture on on their wall, and um, you know it, it kind of turns people off. Again, they're not necessarily anti hunters; they're not they're not pro hunters. But then the you know they keep scrolling through their feed, and then they see. You know, this article about how they need to ban bear hunting in California from these evil trophy hunters that are killing all the bears uh, and and bears are, you know, darn near extinct over it. it, it the way they they the way they portrayed that in that article, uh, which is totally untrue. I mean, we, we could we could sit and talk all, all day until we're blue in the face about how, you know, the, the bear numbers have have almost tripled in the last two and a half decades. Uh, and, and that's not what connects with people that, that you know, people hear that and it's kind of like in one ear and out the other. I, I the, the messaging needs to change somehow and we need to come together as hunters and, and quit fighting about who's an archery hunter versus a rifle hunter and uh, who's a fly fisherman versus a spin fisherman. You, you know, all these things that, that kind of fuel this fire and, and, and con- controversial discussions that happen on Facebook. You know, these people that don't hunt, they see that they see that and they see. These well put together, well market, marketed, well articulated pieces of media that come out that are against hunting and the way that they they word it in in this I mean it's propaganda I mean why, why beat around the bush it's propaganda and and that's what I want to counter that that's we have to find a way to come together and counter that together as hunters or we are going to be looking at bear hunting bands across the the entire United States. And there's no question about that. You mentioned Facebook, Jim, and I'm glad you did. And I was talking to somebody just the other day about this. You know, I'm not on Facebook, probably for a reason, right? <laughs> you know, but, but I will tell you that some of the things that the hunters post on there, I mean, you know, the animal rights folks are constantly combing through Facebook looking for ammunition to use against us. Yeah. And unfortunately, we're putting it out there. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the halls of our state capitol battling some type of anti-hunting proposal, and the animal rights folks are passing around flyers or letters or this or that that are, are you know, using something that, that one of the hunting community posted on Facebook as part of their ammunition. I yeah. mean, so we really have to be cognizant 
of our reputation, I mean, especially on Facebook, but, but throughout every other medium as well, you know, to see through it that hunting is viewed in a f- positive fashion by people that don't hunt, I mean, as opposed to giving them ammunition to use against us. You know, now you mentioned, you know, the number of people that, that let me get to this because you mentioned this a little bit ago about, you know, how California breaks down when it comes to hunters versus anti-hunters. And I already told you that we sell about 250,000 hunting licenses, which is less than 1% here in the state. Mm-hmm. But the numbers that I have seen show that about 10% of Californians are very pro-hunting and about 10% of Californians are very anti-hunting. And the 80% that is in the middle really has no opinion. You know, and, and that's our target when you talk to, about educating and reaching out and trying to get more people to embrace hunting. It's that 80%. And it can be done, but it's going to take all of us to do it. Mm-hmm. You're, you're exactly right. That 80% is, is, I think that's going to be, you know, fairly consistent with, uh, you know, some give or take there throughout the throughout the country. Yeah, you know, that uh, I, I think I want to say nationally, the, the hunting community of committed hunters that go out at least once every five years is somewhere around 10 percent. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but uh, that's I don't know. I read that somewhere. But let's talk about the bear man bill. Um, OK, so. We have, we have, uh, and I tried to get him on the show. Uh, they, they, he has not answered. Uh, if, if somebody in his staff is listening by chance and, uh, y- y- and, and he wants to come on and defend his position, the, the door is open, the invite is open. Senator Scott Weiner uh, sponsored this bill, 252, that is an outright ban on bear hunting. And uh, a lot of it is. You know, based in in the article from the Humane Society that talks about how global warming is reducing the amount of bear habitat, and uh, is there any truth to that, by the way? Well, I will tell you that, and then uh, if you want to blame it on global warming, <laughs> you know, but but yeah, we have suffered some some absolute devastating fires here in California. I lost hundreds of thousands. Well, you know nearly millions of thousands, millions of acres, you know, to fires. You know, but that's not just bear habitat. That's elk habitat. That's deer habitat. That's habitat for a whole variety of species that's out there. And, you know, the revenues that are coming from the bear tag sold here in California, which was $1.4 million last year, goes into an account that we set up, dedicated account within the Department of Fish and Wildlife, that the Department of Fish and Wildlife partners with groups like California Deer, Mule Deer Foundation, Rocky Mountain, and others, to put that habitat back on the ground. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, we've lost some habitat here in California, but it's not just bear habitat. It's habitat for a variety of species. And bear hunting is helping, and the revenues from bear hunting are helping to replace that habitat and get it back on the ground for the benefit of bears and the other species that depend upon it. But that habitat loss is is just temporary. I mean, I mean that when uh, I, I guess I'll put it in the in the, in the Idaho um, context. When we have a big forest fire here, I'm hunting that forest fire area the next year because that's where the game's at. And, Me too. And, yeah. and and so so I mean I I know that that's not they, the way they word it is it's like okay we've got uh, you know everybody's driving a, a an SUV now and it's it's warmed up the planet so much that we're having all these fires has nothing to do with uh, the the lack of logging and forest uh, management and anything like that uh, we we get these big devastating fires and bam permanently this bear habitat is lost right right it, it's an interesting I- way to put it. You're absolutely right, and I'll give you some examples. Some of the, I mean, you know, these climax forests that are out there have, as you know, Jim, zero habitat value. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've got such a massive canopy on them. There's, there's, there's no, there's no food even on the ground for wildlife, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and forest management is a key to that, and the environmental folks can take credit for the fact that we aren't managing our forests right now, which is why we are dealing with the, these massive sweeping fires. But to your point. I'm right there with you. I mean, if, if something burned a year or two ago, I'm hunting that come opening day because that's where the wildlife is. And I'll give you an example. You know, the elk herds up in Northern California now, which are growing, you know, are actually moving into areas that they've never been into before because now we've got that on the ground for them that was never there when you had these climax forests out there. Mm-hmm. You know, it is there now, which is why we're seeing elk in areas where we never have seen them before, because we're starting to get some habitat that they can actually use as a result of fires. Yeah. I mean, you can you can go into an area that was on fire in July 
And come September, you're going to find elk in there. If that fires out, I mean, it could still be even smoldering in places. And and I'm not saying that uh, out of out of uh, some emotional place or anything. I have literally done that. And, and so uh, that that's that's where you're going to find these game animals, uh, including bear. And and so it's it's just a silly argument. But getting back to the the actual bill and the way it was introduced. And uh, and the, you probably have a lot more insight. Can you walk us through the bill being rele- or, or introduced by Senator Weiner and then getting squashed? Yeah, no, there's no question about that. And, and you mentioned earlier in, in this interview, Jim, that, that we knew it was coming. Well, we did know it was coming. I mean, bears have, have always, for the last several years, have been kind of the uh, – the top priority for the animal rights folks here in California. And so now that they've got mountain lions and bobcats taken care of, right? You know, and of course we lost the ability to use hounds on bears back in 2012, you know, with some legislation that outlawed the use of hounds for pursuing bears and bobcats. So we, we knew it was coming. There was a big rumor last year that legislation was going to be introduced, you know, that would prohibit the hunting of bears. Well, it never surfaced. We were ready for it. We had, we had done our homework, you know, we had positioned ourselves to where we were ready for it, never showed up. Well, you know, fast forward to this past November, I got a call from the Capitol. Okay, we got another bill that's going. We knew that the animal rights folks were shopping it around. We didn't know who would author it, you know, and, and then originally they were trying to shop it around on the assembly side. Well, I got word right around Christmas time that the assembly wasn't interested in the bear bill, and I was very pleased to hear that. But I made the comment to the gentleman that called me to tip me off on that. I go, well, we still have the Senate, and fast forward to, uh, you know, about a week and a half ago, and, and here it comes from, from Senator Weiner. You know, so we knew it was coming. We were prepared for it, although you're never really fully prepared for something like this. You know, and, and sure enough, it surfaced with, with 252. And so, uh, fortunately, we, we got on it right away. But, you know, it, 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 the, the key to killing this bill wasn't just activating the hunter community. And I will tell you, like I said, I've done this for 30 years. I've never seen the hunting community get as engaged as they did and as quickly as they did on this bill. Mm-hmm. And, and that certainly played a role in it. Um, but you know, we're going to lose almost every hunter versus animal rights debate in this state only because of our demographics. You know, I think one of the keys to killing this bill was we immediately launched out trying to find other interest groups that that weren't hunting interest groups, but who had, you know, uh, something at stake here. I mean, for example, the Farm Bureau, you know, the ranchers, you know, that are losing livestock to bears. I mean, law enforcement, whether they be with the Department of Fish and Wildlife or or with the the county sheriff or what have you, that's, you know, got all kinds of public safety incidences you know, that they're dealing with all the time that they didn't have to deal with a few years ago. Timber. I mean, bears are tough on timber when they're ripping the bark off of trees and so forth. You know, I mean, you know, wool growers, I mean, you name it, beekeepers. I mean, we, we immediately reached out to as many different groups as we could that weren't hunting groups, but nevertheless, that cared deeply about the need to continue to manage bears and, and got them into our coalition and, and got them fired up as well. And, and, you know, I mean, we just got a, a sweeping group of interest groups, you know, fighting this thing. And then fortunately, Wiener saw the light and pulled the bill. I don't know if you can answer this or not, because I know in your position, you've got to kind of maintain a network and relationships and, and, and things like this. But um, and if it, again, if you can't answer it, no big deal. But what does Scott Wiener know about wildlife management? I, I would say very little. I mean, you know, he represents the San Francisco area. I mean, he doesn't deal with a lot of wildlife related issues. His constituently, constituency certainly doesn't have, you know, uh, issues dealing too much anyway with the, uh, the public safety and so forth. I mean, because there's no bears anywhere near his district, maybe a coyote or two now and then, but that's really about it. You know, so, so very, very little. Um, I, I just think he got caught up in, in, you know, got fed some of the Humane Society stuff and then, you know, yeah. thought that it was time to, to introduce some legislation like this. So you've been dealing with this. something of concern to, to his district. What, what, oh, yeah, exactly. And that was my point. I, I put out a bonus episode uh, discussing this bill before it had been uh, polled uh, and, and talking about this. You know, we're in the middle, we're in the middle of this, this uh, global pandemic, right? We, we've got 
I, I made the point that the, the state of California has a homeless population that is four and a half times greater than the bear population. Uh, there, there's debt. There's uh, all, all these, you know, the, the crime and all these things that are happening, not just in California, but everywhere, right? And I, I guess I just question, like, the timing. D- do you feel like maybe... With all these distractions going on between elections and pandemics and and all this uh, craziness that's been going on uh, that, that 2020 is going to be forever famous for, was all these distractions maybe an opportunity for the anti-hunting uh, movement to, to introduce some kind of legislation as if it can kind of get passed under our noses? Yeah, I, I didn't see it that way. Um, you know, frankly, I was a little bit surprised that, that Wiener would introduce this bill when we were under COVID and various other, you know, things that are much more demanding and much more, uh, you know, critical to the California's public. Yeah, I, I don't. I think you know the humane side probably didn't really think about you know de-COVID this and that, and this is our opportunity. I think they look at the demographics of California. And they say, let's just do it, mm, right? Okay, okay. I mean, we actually used COVID as one of our arguments. And it, it, this is a real true argument. I mean, that, that this is no time to be debating whether or not we should be hunting bears in California. No. I mean, you know, California's public, you know, deserves better right now. Let's this legislature focus on dealing with COVID, dealing on hom- with homelessness and these other issues that, that people the really care about. small businesses that have gone under because of COVID, I mean, we can address that. Uh, right. the, the unemployment rates, the you know all the stuff that's going on that that I, I feel like is just not that bear hunting or banning bear hunting isn't a, a you know priority for us as hunters, but but to somebody like Senator Scott Weiner, I just I just don't I, I guess it's it's hard for me to imagine that some senator is sitting at his desk in in San Francisco, California, stewing about people out hunting bears. Yeah, you know what I mean. It just it's like this weird thing for me. Where where does yeah. like where does this I, I guess uh, actually I don't know how I'm gonna ask that I I had a really good question and this happens quite often on my show where I forget what I was gonna ask but um it's there's there a lot of this is is very cultural and, and like what you said it, you know it's it starts in California and where California goes so goes the nation you know kind of kind of talk where. What do you see as with your – you've got decades of experience uh, as an advocate for, for hunting and wildlife and, and uh, fishing. Where does this cultural shift come from, the, the anti-hunting, the anti uh, – or, or, or so to speak, this uh, wildlife management via ballot box? Uh, do, you, do you have a, an opinion on that, like where that comes from, why, why people even bring it to the table? It's, it's just odd to me. I think because they can, right? You know, and, and again, you look at the demographics of California, you look at how naive, you know, the overwhelming majority, you know, of our public, you know, mm-hmm. those, the 80% that live in the urban areas are when it comes to wildlife management. I, I, I think they know that, that we're ripe for it right here, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, if, if we can get away with it, let's do it. You know, and when you think about it, it's relatively easy to put something on the ballot here in California, you know, as far as the number of signatures and so forth and so on, I, you know, I just think, you know, they're, they're not stopping any anything when it comes to, to pushing stuff in the legislature, at the ballot box, in front of the Fish and Game Commission. I mean, every avenue they can, you know, to, to shut off hunting and take it away from us, they're going to do it. And they know that California is the place they'll be able to, or at least the best place to try anyway. I'm going to I'm going to ask you something super philosophical and we'll, we'll keep it uh, hunting specific. But do you feel like ever... Yeah, in your position, or just you know, as as a guy that likes to hunt and and uh, c- pays attention to things around him, do you feel like a, as a society we were this were this um, first world country that has you know, if we get hungry, we can go down to the dollar menu at McDonald's and 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 we have cable TV and cell phones and all this all these comforts, this uh, this level of uh, comfort and safety within our society that maybe sometimes that's what this this stuff almost comes out of boredom so to speak <laughs> does that make sense you know, like like some of these people have too much time on their hands <laughs> yeah yeah like it's it's like okay well we don't have to worry about what we're what we we don't have to go kill anything for dinner uh we don't have to right. worry about the 
um, you know, whatever wild animal killing them. Uh, we don't live in caves. We don't have to build a fire to stay warm. We don't have to do any of this stuff. Uh, and, and so now what do we do with ourselves other than uh, get ourselves involved in things that have always been societal norms throughout the, the history of the world and meddle in them? You know, no, I, I, I think, you, you know, you, you're, you know, hooking into something there. I, you know, a lot of these people, you know, they, they, they grow up in urban areas, you know, all, all they know about wildlife is what they, you know, may read in the books or, or see on TV. You know, they're really not out there in the wild. I mean, you know, they know nothing about hunting. It's just killing. I, I just think that, uh, you know, it's just a lack of knowledge, you know, and, and then, you know, it just seems that, that uh, you know, a lot of kids are raised this. I mean, who knows some of the things they're teaching in schools and so forth. I mean, they they don't talk about, you know, the history of hunting. They don't talk about wildlife management. Right. No. So I, I just think it's just a matter of uh, people are getting further and further out of touch with wildlife and the need to manage them. And then they have too much time on their hands and they all want to be heroes and save the world from people killing things. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. So, Okay, well, let's kind of start winding this uh, this down a little bit and and talk about the future of Bill 252, because you and I spoke on the phone the other day, uh, pretty briefly, but uh, you and I both know that this bill getting pulled this week does not mean that this bill is permanently out of our life. And so, uh, what what do you foresee happening in the next 12 to 12 months to maybe five years in regards to to California bear hunting? Let let me you know echo what you just said a second ago because I want to make sure this comes out loud and clear to your listeners. This is no time to take a victory lap on this bill. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from what I understand, there's people out there in Facebook that are kind of pounding their chest and saying, "Looky what we did," so on and so forth. Not the time to do that at all. The bill introduction deadline for this session in our state legislature isn't even until the 19th of February. I mean, Wiener did us a favor by introducing this bill as early as he did, you know, because it wouldn't have been heard until March, which gave us several weeks to focus on, on working him to urge him to pull the bill from consideration because we didn't have to worry about working committee members that were sitting on the first policy committee to be heard in any of that kind of stuff, because that was weeks off, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, but we've got about two weeks before the bill introduction deadline even hits. In other words, you know, do I think Wiener's going to gonna dust this off and bring it back out? No, no, no. I, I, I'm confident he won't do that. But another legislator could pick this up this year in California, you know, and technically it's not like he's, he's, you know, gutted the bill and then put something else in it. Technically this bill is still out there. This is the first year of a two year session. He could dust it off next year and, and bring it back. I mean, if he doesn't, somebody else could. So, you know, I mean the, and who knows what the COVID situation will be then, right? You know, it, it may mm -hmm. be even a better playing field for the animal rights folks to, to get the, the legislature to spend some time talking about bears. You know, but but yeah, there's no question in my mind, without a doubt, this bill is going to come back, whether it's next week or next year or three years from now, but it's going to come back. You know, the good news is, is that we've got some time now to step back, you know, and then take a look at, okay, what did we do right on 252? What did we do wrong on 252? What can we do better now that we've got a little bit of time to catch our breath, whether it be two weeks or two years? Right. You know, to prepare ourselves for when this bill does come back. And in fact, to that end, I had a teleconference call with about seven other lobbyists this morning from a variety of interest groups that that coalition that I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh -huh. talking about just that, trying to, to debrief on, on what we did right, what we did wrong. And, and the take home message from that call was keep the pedal to the metal, guys, you know, because it's going to come back. I mean, this little break that we're having gives us time to, to kind of collect our, our, our battle plan and then put it and get it ready for action, you know, so let, let's take advantage of that and then let's keep pedal to the metal and then just gear up to where when the bill does come back that we can come after it. You know, and it's not just a matter of, of hunting bears. I mean, we've had Center for Biological Diversity to go after the hunting of elk. I mean, there's a variety of things that we hunt out there. I mean, they don't want us yeah. to hunt anything, right? It's that, like, that, and that's what like, I was going to ask you is 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 <clears throat> you had some a little bit of of, of uh, warning on this this uh, bill two fifty two. Is there anything else out there that we should all be aware of that that you know about? 
nothing that's been introduced this year, right? I mean, you know, uh-huh. but like I said, I mean, the, the overwhelming majority of bills will be introduced or, or uh, will come out in print on the 19th or, or shortly after the 19th, you know, uh, when that bill introduction comes. Normally, it's the deadline. Normally, it takes like three or four days into the next week before you see them all. But we really don't know what else is out there. There are no rumors swirling right now. Um, but, but you never know what's going to come up. I'm surprised every year by some of the stuff that these guys come up with. And the other thing that we need to be well aware of is the fact that, that what we call a gut and a mint, which is legislation that's out there that has been introduced. It, it may have been through a policy hearing. It may have even gone through fiscal committee. And then suddenly they'll take that bill because for whatever reason, there's no you know, reason to, to keep that bill moving. They'll gut it and they'll put language in it that, that, you know, a tax hunting or, or a, a method of take of hunting or, or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. That's how we lost the ability to use hounds to pursue bears and bobcats. Yep. It yep. was a gut and a man. You know, I mean, so, I mean, the gut and a man is a tool that they've used for quite some time. And, and we need to be aware of that as well. I mean, well after the bill introduction deadline. Okay. So, um, you're not making me feel super comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want you to know that y- you and I, Bill, we need to stay in touch, uh, and, and and we need yeah. to because my platform, um, and, and I've said this on a, a million times on the show, the, the the foundational premise behind my show is to offset the growth of the anti-hunting community and and to lay a foundation for hunters and outdoorsmen that are that are passionate and and to have this coalition of outdoorsmen that are willing to fight and protect our hunting life, lifestyle and our rights and our public land and our wildlife and all these things that's that's a point of the show usually i get on with a hunter and we talk about last year's elk season right and and so and I've got a lot of those conversations lined up, but I'm I'm prioritizing this one because I think it's really important, and and we need to stay in touch. And I am working on a lot of things on my end here that are going to uh, help facilitate a voice for hunters uh, to to help facilitate the fight uh, against the anti hunters. And and so I think that uh, us having this connection is going to be helpful for for both of us. And I want to stay on top of this, and I, I appreciate what you do. Uh, I appreciate having this conversation because you're, you're so uh, tuned into this uh, this California anti-hunting thing that, uh, like you said, it, and, and I've said it, it, it it's going to bleed over into every other state in the United States. And, and this is not this is not like what you were talking about. We we've got this victory lap going around on social media that the Bill 252 was pulled, but guys, this is not the time to celebrate this because this is just the beginning. Actually, it's not the beginning. We're just in the middle of a continued effort and a continued fight to save hunting because hunting, we're at a point where we're either seeing the end of hunting or hunters are going to have to step up. They're going to have to organize. They're going to have to unify, quit fighting over petty things like what kind of rifle you're shooting. Uh, Quit, quit arguing about, somebody's choice in in either method of take or size of game they pursue or, or all these things that tear us apart. Uh, we don't have time for this. We're going to get crushed if we continue on that path. And so, Bill, I appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, do you have any closing thoughts for, for the audience before we, we wrap this up? No, I, I sure do. Uh, you know, I again, you you. you Put your finger right on it. I mean, this is no time to, to thump your chest and say, looky what we did, you know, and, and take a victory lap. But what it is time to do is for the hunting community out there to wake up. I mean, it. I can't tell you how many hunters that I've talked to over the years and tried to get them engaged, write a letter to their assembly member or their senator and so forth. They don't want to do it. They just want to go out and hunt. And I, I get that. I'd rather just go out and hunt too, yeah. right? But yeah, the fact is, sure. if you haven't been politically active, you have to to be politically active. I guarantee you the animal rights folks, every one of their members picks up the phone or, or picks up a pen and paper and writes a letter or calls their, their legislator. Oh man, for sure. That. They're so we, much we more enthusiastic. Be, you know, and, and if you're not a member of, of Rocky Mountain Elk or Cal Deer or, or Ducks Unlimited or whatever, join, right? Because those groups not only are helping put habitat on, I could list a whole bunch of them, right? Turkey Federation, you know, you name it, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, they're helping to put habitat on the ground that's helping to keep our populations, you know, of, of game, you know, healthy and non-game for that matter. But they're also a good 
medium for getting word out to their members, right, as to what's happening out there, you know, on the ground politically, right? You know, the other thing is people, like we talked about, Jim, reach out to somebody that's not a hunter. Take the time to, to try to gently educate them about the positive role that hunters play when it comes into wildlife conservation and protect and embrace our image. I mean, you know, the, the perception of the, the folks that don't hunt out there, that live in downtown Los Angeles, downtown San Francisco, whatever it may be. I mean, make sure that we're portraying an image to them that is positive you know, in terms of the positive things that we do, you know, and whether that be what you post on Facebook or, or whatever, I mean, you know, there's a variety of things that they can do, you know, to, to help, you know, pave the way for, you know, the next battle that we're going to face and make it a little bit easier to win. Well said. And I'd like to, I'd like to kind of reinforce what you were talking about with groups like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and other organizations out there. Um, irregardless, or actually, my wife tells me all the time, irregardless is not a word, Jim. Just say regardless. So She's right, by the way. <laughs> she is right. <laughs> I know. I looked it up. I tried to fact check her, and she got me. <laughs> but, okay, right, right. regardless of whether or not these organizations are uh, doing 100% of things that you agree with or uh, you might disagree with one thing or, or that thing or, you know, whatever – small aspect of their entire full mission that you disagree with should not negate you from joining these organizations. And I'll, I'll add something to what they do. Organizations, especially the bigger ones like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, they, they are a hunting advocacy group. I promise you that the anti-hunting organizations like the Humane Society have on-staff attorneys that are active and they're, they're and not just attorneys. They have you know lobbyists and and everything else that they have. These folks that are that are advocating to take your right to hunting away. Places like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and and other organizations, they need the funding so because they provide the same thing for us, right? Does that make sense? Uh, uh, absolutely, it does. We and need these full time people. Funding. They need that funding now more than ever, mm-hmm. Jim. I mean, you know, I'm not sure, you know, what what it's like in Idaho, but you know, out here in California, they can't have dinners, they can't have the, you know, the standard, you know, live auctions and raffles and so on and so forth. I mean, these groups are really struggling at a time when we need them more than ever. Well, I'll I t- mean, so I'll now you, that, is, is yeah, we're not having those banquets either. I I was supposed to probably go to three or four different banquets since this last fall, and and then they they were all canceled. Uh, and so you're right. The, the funding is low uh, because of COVID-19. There, you know, the banquets were were a huge money, you know, revenue generator for for these organizations. And I know people get tired of hearing about fundraising this and donate here and donate there. And people do get tired of that. But if if you value hunting, now is the time to fork up some dough. Or fork up some time to volunteer, or make phone calls, or send emails. Or you know whatever we can do to help help our cause, uh, the, the the opportunities out there. Right. You know, and the other thing is, and I would I would hope that a lot of your listeners are already all over this, but these virtual auctions. I mean, a lot of these groups now there's like onlinehuntingauction.com and so forth. Mm-hmm. You know, these organizations are going out and they're doing they're doing uh, silent and live auctions online. Now, Bill. Right. I mean, now, Bill, so, don't don't let that secret out of the bag because right now when you get <laughs> online. They'll, they'll send those online auctions in an email. Not a lot of people enroll in those, so your odds of winning a rifle or something are really high. And, and I, I like I like. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's that's our little secret. Yeah, right, right. Not anymore. <laughs> no, but I've been very active on those, and, and uh, yeah. they're actually a lot of fun. You could do them from your you know your own you know office or, or kitchen or whatever. I mean, yeah. you know, so take yeah. advantage of those. You'll get some good buys, and you'll be supporting a, a very very good cause at the same time. Exactly, exactly. So, well, Bill, I sure appreciate you coming on the show. I think this is going to go a long way uh, to help our cause. And and like I said, you and I need to stay in touch and uh, make sure that we are, uh, you know, working in unison so we can we can help you guys. Because we, uh, you know, fr- from my standpoint over here in Idaho, I want I want my uh, my friends in California that haunt to know I, I've got your back. We've got your back. 
And, uh, you know, that goes for, for our trappers in New Mexico dealing with that legislation and, and the, the spring right. bear hunt issue going on in Washington. And, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of things going on this winter. And, uh, well, we just, uh, we want to have everybody's back and, and do what we can, uh, to, to see things go our way or otherwise we're going to get stomped. And so we're just, we're just trying to prevent that. Right. We're all, we're all in this together and there's just not enough of us to, uh, you know, to be able to say, yeah, they don't need my help. No, no, no. We need everybody's help. on. Yeah. It. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to just talk hunting all, all the time. You know, uh, what kind of elk strategy do you have? What, what, how do you, how, what kind of bugles do you recommend? What kind of, you know, mule deer hunting do you do? You know, I'd, I'd love to just have those conversations all the time, but we, we do have to have these conversations. It's, it's just, it's the days of, you know, a hunter just buying a tag, a deer tag every year and calling yourself a conservationist and a protector of hunting, those days are gone. Those days are simply gone. We all have to step up and do a little bit more. And we're working on a lot of ways to make that easier for hunters here at the Western Huntsman. It's just taking us some, uh, it's going to take me some time to get this all put together, but uh, we got some good stuff coming up. So stay tuned for that. And Bill, thanks again. Uh, hopefully we could jump on and, uh, and get you back on the show down, down the road here. Well, you, you know how to get a hold of me, Jim, and just one final comment. You know, way back at the beginning of this interview, I, I made the point, and I stand by it now, that, that nobody hates politics more than I do. Mm-hmm. And I know there's a lot of hunters out there that hate politics every bit as much as I do. You know, but, but I got engaged because I saw to it that I had to get engaged, and, and I'd make that same argument to everybody else out there. Okay, how much you hate politics? No, learn who your legislator is. You know, and, and get oh, to know point. them, take the time to meet with them, and, and, and just stay politically active because every single one of us has to be if we're going to win this battle over the long term. Great point. Great point. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more with that, Bill. Well, thanks again. Uh, we're we're going to keep in touch, and we'll talk to you soon, my friend. I, I appreciate uh, you coming on and sharing all this information with us. Well, thank you, Jim, for the opportunity, and it was my pleasure. made it all the way to the end thank you so much for tuning into the show we sure appreciate your support this is jim huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at instagram at the western huntsman and on facebook at the western huntsman and you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com thanks again we'll see you guys next time stay western and i'll see you on the mountain